So this is a second of our two videos on glacier temperatures and in this one I want to say a little bit about the basal thermal regime. In other words, I want to emphasise the importance of temperature in the glacier bed environment, at the glacier base. So, we're thinking about this situation, we have the glacier, ice surface, glacier, glacier bed. And in this area, where we're talking about glacier dynamics, impact of glacier on the substrate, generating geomorphic uh, features, geomorphic processes operating in that environment. What we're talking about is the temperature regime in that location. And there are two sets of parameters, if you like, that we can think about based on what we were talking about previously in terms of glacier temperature being uh, determined by uh, influences from above, influences from below, and processes operating in the interior. When we're thinking about the basal thermal regime, we're interested particularly in the arrival of heat at the base of the glacier, so heating at the base as a result of uh, geothermal heat flux and processes operating at the bed, and conduction of that heat away from the bed, removing it from that basal environment. So we can have maybe more heat being supplied than is being removed, and you expect then to have melting, or you can have heat being removed very efficiently and the heat supply from underneath not being able to keep up with that, in which case you could imagine having a cold basal environment. And so we typically talk about environments of basal melting, environments of basal freezing, and environments where there's a balance between melting and freezing. And the temperature regimes that people commonly refer to in glaciers are warm or temperate for glaciers where the ice is at or close to uh, the melting temperature and cold, or polar, where the ice is below the melting temperature. And nowadays people tend to refer to them as uh, warm and cold rather than temperate uh, and polar. Or the third category, polythermal, where there are different temperatures in different locations. And certainly if you start thinking about the detail of processes such as regulation that we've talked about previously, it's difficult to imagine that most glaciers don't have a, at least an element of a polythermal character uh, about them. Now already from the kinds of things I've been drawing on here and talking about previously and the idea that different things are going on at different locations of bed, different processes are happening, different thicknesses of ice therefore, different abilities of the glacier to conduct heat away, different supply of heat to the bed, different processes happening at the bed, it's no surprise to discover that thermal conditions are different in different locations of the bed. In other words, here's my key point, there is a geography of basal thermal regimes. There are warm zones, there are cold zones, and there are transition zones between the warm and the cold. Now, if there's a geography of basal thermal regime, well, that's going to lead to a geography of basal processes, where there's water, where melting is happening, where freezing on is happening at the bed, where there's more movement or where there's less movement because of the availability of water, because of the, uh, the temperature of regime. So we have a geography of basal thermal regime leading to a geography of basal processes, and that's going to lead to our geography of geomorphology. So one of the major controls that you might already imagine being fundamental to the geography of landforms and landscapes, to geomorphology, is the geography of the basal thermal regime. And that's why the basal thermal regime, well that's one of the reasons why the basal thermal regime is really important uh, for us to be talking about at this stage in the module. So let me just talk you through a few slides that are relevant to those ideas about the basal thermal regime that I was just uh, trying to demonstrate on the, on the whiteboard. The key point is about the importance of temperature in basal processes. I'm sure you're already familiar with a lot of these uh, key issues from what we've talked about previously in, in the module. The idea of temperature controlling the availability of water at the bed, which is important for lubrication, for glacier sliding, uh, the importance of melting as part of the regulation process, the importance of temperature affecting uh, the, the A term, the hardness parameter uh, in Glenn's flow law with regard to enhanced basal creep, again, for movement at the bed of the glacier. If we're talking about the deformability of a permeable substrate, that's going to be temperature dependent, determined by uh, whether the, the water in the substrate is liquid or frozen.
and all sorts of uh, processes to do with basal ice formation and the possibility of entrainment of debris into the glacier bed, the formation of new ice at the base, or the melting of ice at the bed to produce meltwater, and all the implications of stable isotope glaciology for thinking about fractionation occurring in the refreezing, or the partial or complete refreezing, uh, of that meltwater uh, to produce basal ice. So we're really interested in the basal thermal regime, the question of whether a glacier has a warm base, a cold base, or whether it's polythermal with different thermal conditions uh, existing in different parts of the glacier bed. And the scenarios that we illustrated earlier, the ideas are either more heating is occurring at the base that can be dealt with by conduction of heat away from the base, in which case you get basal melting, or alternatively, if conduction away from the base is getting rid of all the heat that's being supplied, then you'd expect uh, basal freezing and a, a, a bed that's, uh, a glacier that's frozen to its bed. Or you might expect a balance between heating and conduction away, in which case you'd get a balance between uh, melting and freezing. But if you have these different scenarios happening in different locations around the base, then also be aware that you have the transition zones between them, the boundary between a melting zone and a frozen zone, well that's going to be where freezing on at the base of the glacier might be expected to happen. So particular things are going to be happening within these different um, basal thermal areas, but other things are going to be happening right at the boundaries between them. So we're particularly interested in this module, since it's a geography module, about this geography of the basal thermal regime. And these are going to be controlled partly by things like ice sheet geometry, where the ice is thick, where the ice is thin, that's going to make a difference to how much heat, uh, how effectively heat is being uh, conducted away from the, from the base, for example. The basal thermal regime is also then going to control things like the rheology of the the dynamics of the, of the ice, the movement of the ice through Glen's flow law, through, through sliding and so on, and that in turn is going to have a feedback effect on ice sheet geometry. We've talked about that earlier in the, uh, in the module, how the, um, the morphology or the geometry, the shape of an ice mass is related in both directions to the rheology and the dynamics. So shape controls dynamics, dynamics controls uh, shape. You're familiar with that already. And that interaction between ice sheet geometry or glacier geometry and dynamics, that's going to be a major control on geomorphic processes. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple uh, of examples of that work by Jeff Bolton uh, and Dave Sugden, uh, illustrate uh, the importance of this to, our, to us as geographers looking at geomorphology uh, related to glaciers. Bolton's work and Sugden's work is particularly uh, important. So here's a, a slide uh, lifted from uh, one of Jeff Bolton's papers, and it just makes a very simple point that in different thermal regimes at the base of a glacier, so the four diagrams there represent, well, on the top left there's warm base, in the bottom left there's cold based, then on the right hand side there are more complex situations where we have different zones uh, underneath the glacier, including transition zones, and you can see on the right hand side there he's added in basal processes such as, for example, abrasion occurring with the existence of meltwater in the warm-based zone. In the transition towards the cold-based zone we have freeze-thaw and entrainment of debris and then in the cold-based zone we have only minor abrasion. So he's relating geomorphic processes and hydrological um, events, if you like, the melting, the freezing, the freezing on, he's associating those with uh, different thermal regimes and in the bottom example there, again, pause me as you do and have a, have a longer look at these and look at the original work and, and read up on this. But in the bottom right hand corner there he's identifying a zone of no erosion in the cold based ice and then zones of abrasion and meltwater with the warm based ice followed by a zone of uh, entrainment uh, before we reach uh, the cold based margin. So it's a very close association between thermal regime and geomorphic processes. This is something we're going to be moving on to very soon now as we move forward in this module. And here's another example, this is from Dave Sugden's work on the Laurentide ice sheet, which is basically arriving at the same uh, conclusion relating different thermal regimes 
cold based uh, in the top in the left hand side of that top diagram for example cold based ice associated with no erosion and a warm melting environment associated with erosion and again as you get more and more complex thinking about uh, different thermal uh, zones and the boundaries or the transitions between those then you can begin to predict all sorts of different complex process assemblages going on and you can begin to predict the impact of those on the geomorphology. So there's a couple of slides there that you can, again, you can pause and have a, have a think through and just consider the implications of thermal regime for processes at the bed, what's happening with the water, what's happening with melting and freezing, what's happening therefore with debris entrainment, erosion, transport, deposition, impact of the glacier on its bed. Um, think through the implications of these diagrams. Um, but note that the, the main thing we're trying to identify here is simply that thermal regime has a major impact on glacier behaviour and on geomorphology. So I want to finish off with a, a quick case study that just brings us back to a topic we were talking about earlier in the module, uh, which is the formation of basal ice. And this is just a, a description of some work that I was involved in many, many years ago uh, in West Greenland. Uh, so we're looking at an ice sheet margin with lobes uh, and embayments, in other words, outlet glaciers and areas of higher land uh, separating the outlet glaciers and there's a couple of photographs there to show you the kind of an air photograph in the bottom there to show you the kind of environment we're talking about um, in, in this uh, in this location just above the arctic circle uh, near, near Kangluthwak uh, in west greenland and here's a map which is taken from the, uh, the, the paper that I'm talking about uh, I'm showing you this it's a bit of a messy map but I'm showing you this just because it indicates uh, in the bottom of the diagram there with those arrows. It indicates how we were sampling around uh, one of these big lobes and into the embayments on either side of the lobe, looking at the characteristics of the base ice and relating those partly to the thermal regime and the variations in the thermal regime underneath the glacier, at the bed of the glacier, the basal thermal regime. And here's a, uh, a satellite image of the whole area. Um, and the glacier that we're looking at, the Russell Glacier and the Leverett Glacier, they're about a third of the way down uh, from the top of that diagram. Uh, but it gives you an illustration there of the complexity of that ice sheet margin, partly because of the topography where there are um, areas of higher land and there are valleys uh, in between those areas of higher land through which the outlet glaciers are emerging. Well, we went to explore around the margin of one of these outlet uh, glaciers, and we were interested to see how the characteristics of the basal ice sequence could be related uh, to the basal thermal regime. And in particular, we, we were interested, or I'm going to talk to you uh, just now, about our particular interest in the dispersed fasces, which, you, which you'll remember is the fasces of the basal ice, which has these, uh, well at the time, these mysterious debris aggregates, we sometimes call them clots of debris, uh, within the dispersed fasces. And there's some controversy, some di um, discussion as to exactly how those were created. And one of our hypotheses at the time was that they were created um, by the flow of water through the vein network in some kind of metamorphic process, uh, rather than being directly frozen on from underneath. And that being the case, our hypothesis was that this ice was being transported to the margin from, from further in the interior. It wasn't being created uh, right at the margin. And so we were looking partly at the impact of varying basal thermal regimes on this basal ice layer as it approached the margin. So here are the key points that we were, well, that we arrived at. Uh, the distribution of basal ice fasces at the site is controlled by the geography of the basal thermal regime. That's what we're, we're, we're talking about. The dispersed ice, which is what I'm going to talk to you about just now in, in more detail, we're arguing is created in the interior, and it's maybe preserved uh, as it flows towards the margin, or it might be destroyed by localised basal, mar uh, basal melting. The stratified fasces is created by freezing, uh, so cold conditions, of subglacial water. And if there was subglacial water, then we must have had a, at some point a warm location for that water to be uh, created. And the debris bands were created by tectonic compression due partly to marginal freezing, so again, temperature related. So those three key points about the origin of the, dis the dif different basal ice fasces at, at that site, all of them relate to issues to do with the basal thermal regime. And that reference there, uh, that's where you can find uh, all the information uh, on that, from which I'm just going to draw a couple of key points now to illustrate for you um, what we're talking about with regard particularly uh, to the dispersed fasces. So these cartoons kind of illustrate what we thought was happening. So in the top diagram there you've got a picture 
cutaway block diagram showing the topography of the ice margin with hills and valleys and then the ice sheet itself arriving from the top right or arriving from the background if you like and dividing itself and splitting around these areas of high land sending glaciers down uh, the lobes uh, down into the valley into the valleys and diagram B at the bottom there that shows what we are hypothesizing is happening to the dispersed fasces of the basal ice as it splits and flows around uh, those hills. What we'd identified was that the size of the debris aggregates within the ice is largest in the lower sections of the basal layer and decreases progressively until the, the clots disappear completely at the top of the basal ice fasces or at the top of the dispersed uh, fasces. And what we're saying there is that what appears to be happening is that the ice is splitting and going around uh, the hills rather than just riding over the top of them uh, like a blanket. So um, you would predict just from looking at that diagram, if we're right, that if you're standing at the top of one of those hills and looking at the ice in one of the embayments at the margin, you'd be expecting to see small aggregates, small clots. Whereas if you were down in the valley bottom, well, the largest clots, the bottom of the base ice, is being diverted around those hills, and you're going to find it at the ends of the outlet glaciers, not at the tops of the embayments at the tops of the hills. There's another diagram there just kind of illustrating that same uh, idea um, in, a, in a, maybe a slightly clearer format there in, block, in, in diagram C, where you can see we've kind of split the ice up as if it was different layers of base ice, and you can see that if you want to find the lowest layers, you need to go and look in the valley bottoms, and if you want to find the highest layers exposed at the margin, then you need to go and look at the tops of the hills. So the bottom diagram there shows you where you would expect to find the largest debris aggregates at the front of the, uh, the glaciers and the smallest debris aggregates if you're walking around the margin where well, you'll find those high up in the embayments in between the valley glaciers. However, there's another process that we uh, can recognise going on and that is that in the centre lines or down the flow lines, down the deepest parts of the, the valley glaciers, the outlet glaciers that are emerging from the ice sheet, there are warmer basal thermal conditions and therefore melting occurring. So in addition to changing the distribution of the basal ice by making it flow around those hills, we're also changing the distribution of the basal ice by, in some locations, melting off the bottom layers of the basal ice. So in this diagram you can see in the at the top of the box in picture A, if there's no basal melting, then the entire basal ice sequence will survive all the way to the margin. But if you do have some basal melting, then what you're going to be losing through that basal melting is preferentially and initially the bottom of the basal ice layer, in other words, the bit where the, the largest, the larger debris aggregates were. So on the basis of that, you would predict just on the basis of this effect, ignoring the other effect, you'd expect there to be no or only small debris aggregates left at the, um, the, the fronts of the valleys and you'd expect the bigger uh, debris aggregates, the bigger clots, to be, to be surviving um, in, the, in the inland uh, up, on the, up on the hills in the embayments. So what happens if you combine both of those two effects? Well, what you end up with is this, and this is exactly what we found. If you go and read the paper, you'll see that this is exactly what we discovered, so it completely matches up with um, those hypotheses that we're, we're presenting there, that if you have a complete basal ice layer arriving close to the margin uh, and encountering this um, mixed topography and mixed basal thermal regime, you'll lose the bigger clots uh, the bigger aggregates from these areas at the heads of the embayments because the base ice is being diverted into the valleys. In the valleys, you're losing the base, uh, the base of the base ice, the bottom of the base ice, you're losing that due to melting because of the um, warm thermal conditions underneath uh, the, the centre lines of these uh, valleys. So if you want to find the complete basal ice sequence all the way from the bottom to the top, not having lost any either due to flow diversion or due to melting, then the locations to go are halfway up the, at the sides of these valley glaciers where you haven't lost ice from the bed due to melting and you haven't diverted, you, you haven't lost ice by diverting it away, uh, away from the flow line that you're uh, looking at. So that's just a, 
a quick example of how you can apply ideas about the basal th thermal regime and, and temperature conditions at the base affecting melting and so on to all sorts of different situations. We're going to talk about it much more in the context of geomorphology over the next, well, from now until the, the end of the module, beginning now to focus more on landforms and geomorphology. And this geography of the basal thermal regime is going to be a major control on geomorphology. But I just wanted to throw in that case study as well, kind of looking backwards in the module, back to when we were talking about base lines, just to remind you that thermal regime was really important in that context as well. So here by way of uh, just a few quick conclusions, temperature is important, ice properties, glacier dynamics, hydrology and geomorphology. I was going to say it goes without saying but I'm saying it because it's really important, it needs to be said. In particular temperature at the bed of the glacier is especially important. Now I've been arguing all the way through this module that what's happening at the bed of the glacier is what really matters because that's the, the business end of the glacier, particularly in terms of geomorphology. So it should come as no surprise to you uh, to hear me saying now that not only is temperature important, but in particular temperature at the bed of the glacier, the basal thermal regime is particularly important. Now one thing that's beginning to emerge, what always happens, we talk about one thing and something else uh, emerges as an important issue. Uh, you'll have recognised over the, the, um, these last couple of sessions that glacier hydrology is playing an important role in the link between thermal regime and geomorphic processes, for example. Hydrology plays a, an important role in several parts of the glacier system. So don't neglect that in your reading or when you're putting together your map of how everything in glaciology hangs together. Uh, you'll need to find out a little bit about water and find out a little bit about glacier hydrology as well to build into the, the mix of your understanding of glaciers and glacial landscapes.